Thank you for watching us on YouTube. But did you know that if you're on the go, you can get the full show as a podcast now? You can get our morning breakdown of the most important topics facing our country, news not being covered by the mainstream media, interviews with change-making progressives, and info on what you can actually do about all this. Search for The Damage Report on your favorite podcast app and subscribe so you know when new episodes are ready to go. We're joined now by Lori Penny, author of No, I Will Not Debate You. Always love having Lori on. Welcome to the show. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good and uh, glad uh, to have you back. So, uh, look, I read your your last article recently and and absolutely loved it because I've uh, been feeling quite similarly. Your your article is basically about what debate represents in today's discourse, and uh, so it looks like it was started though by uh, Steve Bannon and him being initially invited to an event and then had the event canceled. Can you walk us through that and what led to you writing this article? No, I will not debate you. Right. So I'd had it in my mind for. I mean, years now, basically, because look, I get into a lot of fights online. I, it's not my favorite thing to do, but it's kind of a side hobby when you write about politics on the internet. You always get people saying, well, you know, if if you're so against these people, whoever they are, you know, misogynist, fascist, then why don't you just debate them in the marketplace of ideas as if debate were this magical thing that could solve all political problems. And... Um, when Steve Bannon, lately uh, Trump's previous you know, chief of staff and the architect of Breitbart News and you know, white supremacist, among other awful things, was recently disinvited from the New Yorker festival, the literary festival, uh, because uh, various people who were attending said, no, we don't want to attend and be on the same stage as Bannon. And Bannon seems to be basically on a tour of literary festivals and events around Europe at the moment. And one of them was the Economist Festival in London, uh, where he was due to be appearing via video link and indeed and indeed did so. And um, I was due to be speaking at the Economist Festival as well on the panel right before. And what happened, I didn't realize that Bannon was on the program as well. Uh, the panel I was meant to be on was about Me Too, what next after the Me Too movement. And uh, one of my fellow panelists, Ali Fogg, got in contact with me and he said, look, how do you feel about this? And I said, well, no, hang on, no, I don't want to be giving legitimacy to, to Bannon by appearing on, a, on the platform that he's due to speak at. And so Ali and me and some of our fellow panelists got together and just just said, no, we don't want to do this. And um, I wasn't, none of us were expecting it to cause as much fuss as it did, but it seemed like a good time to finally get all these ideas about debate out into the public arena. I also think it's significant that it was, it was the Me Too panel and the men and women on that panel who were the first people to stand up, at least at the Economist event and say, no, this is, this is not okay. This having this man on the platform, however much you challenge him, legitimizes legitimizes his ideas. And we've already heard enough from people who from, from white supremacists and misogynists and racists. We don't need to legitimate legitimize those ideas anymore. So uh, in your article, you talk about Steve Bannon and um, his you know his claims of censorship when he's taken off these panels. But you also talk more broadly about the concept of debate in the modern era and the. Popular mythology is that you debate people because both people honestly want to present their argument, change the mind of the person on the stage with them, change the mind of the people in the audience. It's this intellectual exercise in the, um, I guess, in the tradition of the great Greek debaters and things like that. Um, is that for many of these, the fascists, the white supremacists, the misogynists, and right, is that what they're actually doing? And if not, why do they want to have these debates? Well, look, firstly, you've got to understand that. Every, you know, I've interviewed and spoken with people on the far right. I'm not against talking to those people at all. Um, but because I think you can understand stuff about this movement by doing journalism. But every single one of them I've encountered is deeply litigious. They are incredibly censorious. They don't actually care about free speech. Uh, free speech for these people is just... <laughs> 
honestly, I really do think it is a gotcha. It's a way of of suckering people into into getting these ideas into the mainstream. They will cry censorship when they're not allowed to debate on public platforms and not allowed to, you know, pump out their propaganda. But as soon as women or people of color are saying anything they don't like to hear, they will they feel completely free to harass those people and drive them out of public life and drive them out of public spaces. And um, to me, that is what is that if not censorship? There is there is profound hypocrisy here. Um, but look, as you can probably hear, I'm I'm from the UK and I went to quite a posh school. And um, at that posh school, like in, in lots of schools in the US, debate was this enormous thing. You know, I was on the debate team. I actually got kicked off the debate team, but that's <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I got to. Actually, no, that's interesting. So the reason I got kicked off the debate team was I got over invested in my topics. Um, and that's the one thing you're not meant to do in debate. You're not meant to have skin in the game. But I would get too over emotional about whatever it was we were supposed to be debating about. And, you know, I didn't want to focus on humiliating the other person. I just wanted to, you know, I just just wanted to make the case as well as I could. And, and I would I would lose every time. Because in debate, in traditional classical debate, it's not persuading the other person that makes you win. It, it's, it's humiliating the other person. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no room in classical debate for the two people on either side or the four people or whoever many people it may be to actually say, is there any common ground here? You know, can we can we reach any point of agreement? It's just meant to be a fight. It's a competition. And I'm not sure that's how we actually build better ideas and build a better society. Um, You know, there's so much to discuss here, but honestly, I'm just sick of it. I'm sick of this debate format. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's the way that we, um, that we, that we heal the deep political divisions in in our society at all. And and what I, what I like about that is that you at least appear to implicitly believe that if we're going to have debates, they should try to heal the divisions in our society. But there, there are many people, sort of professional debaters, that's what they do. They're either professional debaters or they're professional debate me bro people. They constantly are asking people to debate them. There's people on the right who've made their entire careers out of this. Um, so the idea is that you, you'll you have them and you'll have the champion on the left who will go against them. And uh, maybe the, the person on the right wins, maybe the person on the left makes them look ridiculous, points out the inaccuracies, the, the lies that they've told, the clear misogyny, things like that. In general, with these figures though, does the person on the right care if the things they've said that are untrue are pointed out or if they're made to look ridiculous or anything like that? Like you describe these debates as hierarchical and performative and about yeah. brand building. So does it yeah. actually matter how good your debate is? Well, what matters, look, you hit on something really, really important there, because debate in the way that it's come down to us, it isn't about conversation, it's theatre, it's performance. And that's why it's so important to me, um, at least, that you don't let fascists and you don't let people on the far, far right occupy that space. Because really, it's about getting your face out there. It's about having snappy lines. It's about persuading people that you deserve to be in this position of authority. Because being somebody up on a stage representing a view is a position of authority. Honestly, you know, what I found, I've been doing this for, you know, 12 years now, writing in public and um, and speaking in public. And what I've found is that very, very few people actually have their minds fully changed in the court, particularly if they're a person on the stage, but mm-hmm. you know, even if they're in the audience, being told that you're wrong and being humiliated, very, very few people on hearing that they're wrong about something they deeply believe will say, oh my goodness, thank you. You know, I never knew that I was wrong about everything I believe. Let me change my entire life now that you've humiliated me and shown me up. What happens is that people get angry. And eventually, maybe they go away, they have a think about it. And eventually, maybe they come to a different point of view. But that's not, it's not about changing minds. It's about grandstanding. And it's about occupying space. And that's why I believe that this culture of debate, this idea of debate as the ultimate form of public conversation is really, really harmful. I mean, this is one of the one of the real one of the mistakes that the left makes time and time again, which is the idea that just by pointing out where somebody is factually wrong, 
that's enough to win the argument. It's never enough to win the argument. If you don't have a good story, if you don't have good performance, yeah. then just yeah. saying that somebody's wrong is never gonna, I, mean, I wish it did, but it doesn't. Yeah, it's a great fantasy, it's just not one backed up by much evidence in recent history at least. So <laughs> I, I wanna ask you about one thing, and it sort of gets into what you were saying there, that I think a lot of people on the left honestly believe, they're in earnest saying, if we take them on and beat them by pointing out where they're wrong, that is how yeah. we can just, We'll destroy them. That's what the articles always say. They're destroyed. I, I notice that they always bounce back How the next day. <laughs> They're never actually destroyed. Yeah, but, um, I, don't, I don't see. Look, I feel like we've given, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. This idea that, yes, yeah, sunlight is the best disinfectant. You hear this again and again. If we just expose the moral failings of the far right, then, you know, everybody will see what bad people they are. Yeah. And, and and it will, actually, I looked up, It's that's not just inaccurate. The metaphor is also inaccurate. I looked it up. Sunlight is not, in fact, the best disinfectant. The best disinfection is bleach. <laughs> 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 Don't use bleach in your debates, though. No, no. Uh, so I mean, we only have a little bit of time, but I do wanna ask you one more question. Um, as sort of a counterexample to that idea that we will take them on and we will defeat them and drive them away into the shadows and humiliation. Um, there is someone who is much less talked about and much less present than they were two or three years ago, and that is Milo. Uh, was <laughs> Milo defeated by brave champions on the left taking him on in debate? Uh, no, no, he was not. Um, he was defeated by people eventually getting tired of his, sorry, I'm not allowed to say that on TV. <laughs> but people are eventually getting tired of his nonsense and um, and the martyr thing running out. Because look, this, ban not banning, but refusing to allow people to have that public platform to debate, it gets you either way, right? Because if you do let people have that public space, then they can say whatever they want, they build their brand. But if you don't let them have it, then they say, oh no, censorship, martyrdom, free speech. So, <laughs> Either way they get you, but on balance, I think denying that platform, refusing to engage, like you would refuse to engage with a child who's having a tantrum, for God's sake. That's the best policy long term because they can only play that I'm a martyr thing for so long before everybody just gets bored and moves on. Yeah. And that's what ha what's happened with Milo. And that's eventually what happens with all people when you deny them, when you just take the oxygen away from them. Um, and yes, in the short term, they can claim that they're brave free speech martyrs, but after a while, you know, after a while, people just forget. People move on to different ideas. Yeah. And, you know, sorry. <laughs> well, that, that actually makes sense because we, uh, we are unfortunately out of time as well. <laughs> right. uh, but uh, Lori Penny, a journalist and author, uh, always glad to have you on. Thank you uh, for coming on and talking about your most recent article. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.